namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya November 19, 2014, Soho Street Temple, London, England, Hare And we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 75, Duryodhana Humiliated, text 1 through 3. Shall I also read? Where's your wife? Hawaii. She's in Hawaii. Oh, she knows where to be in November. Um, do we read the chapter summary too? Yes? This chapter describes the glorious conclusion of the Rajasriya sacrifice and how Prince Duryodhana was humiliated in King Yudhisthira's palace. At the time of Maharaj Yudhisthira's Rajasriya sacrifice, many of his relatives and well-wishers endeavored to please him by performing necessary services. When the sacrifice was complete, the king adorned the priests, the exalted members of the assembly, and his own relatives with fragrant sandalwood paste, flower garlands, and fine clothing. Then they all went to the banks of the Ganges to perform the ritual bathing that marks the end of the sponsor's period of initiation for the sacrifice. Before the final bathing, there was much sporting in the river among the male and female participants. Sprinkled with aromatic water and other liquids, Draupadi and the other ladies appeared most beautiful, their faces shining with bashful laughter. After the priests had executed the final rituals, the king and his queen, Srimati Draupadi, bathed in the Ganges, then all those present who belonged to the order, orders of Vanaprastha bathed. Yudhisthira put on new clothes and worshipped the learned Brahmanas, his family, friends, and well-wishers, each in the particular manner suitable for them, and offered them all various gifts. The guests then departed for their homes. But King Yudhisthira was so anxious about his imminent separation from those who were dear to him that he compelled several of his relatives and closest friends, including Lord Krishna, to remain in Indrapasta a bit longer. King Yudhisthira's royal palace had been constructed by Maya Dhanava, who had endowed it with many wonderful features and opulences. King Duryodhana burned with envy when he saw these riches. One day, Yudhisthira was seated with Lord Krishna in his royal assembly hall. Attended by his subordinates and family members, he was manifesting magnificence equal to that of Lord Indra. At that time, Duryodhana entered the hall in a fitful mood. He was actually described as always in an angry mood. Do you know people like that? They're like never peaceful. Bewildered by the mystic craft of Maya Dhanava, Duryodhana mistook parts of the solid floor for water and thus lifted his garment. While in one place he fell into the water, mistaking it for the solid floor. We were even laughing about this thousands of years later. When Bhimasena, the ladies of the court, and the royal princes present saw this, they began to laugh. So what should we do if we do something foolish and people laugh at us? We get angry. Yeah, we get angry. What should we do? No. Laugh with them. <laughs> hey, this Duryodhana takes himself much too seriously. I mean, really, he takes himself much too seriously. He thinks he can never make a mistake. Do you know people like that? I think they can never make a mistake. And if you say, ah, excuse me, ah, I think you made a mistake. Not me, make a mistake. <laughs> Your mistake. Although Maharaj Yudhisthira tried to stop them, Lord Krishna encouraged their laughter. <laughs> Thoroughly embarrassed, Duryodhana left the assembly hall in a fury and immediately <clears throat> departed for Hastina. Did he need to be embarrassed? Was that necessary? Yeah, it was his choice, wasn't it? All right. Text 1 through 2. Sri Raja Uvacha, Ajata Shatros Tam Drisva, Raja Suya Mahodayam, Sarve Mamudire Brahman, Nir Deva, Ye Samangataha, Duryodhana Vajaititva, Rajana Sarsaya Suraha, Iti Shrutam No Bhagavams, Tatra Karanam Uchitam. Maharaj Brikit said, O Brahmana, according to what I have heard from you, all the assembled kings, sages, and demigods, we're delighted to see the wonderful festivities of King Ajatashastu's Rajasuya sacrifice with the sole exception of Duryodhana. Please tell me why this was so, my lord. So this is 
the Tadvidi Pranipatnya Pariprashmina Sevaya, that one should ask questions. Without the questions of the devotees, there would be no Shastra. It's all the questions that Maharaj Parikit's asking the sages at Namasharana, the questions that's prompting the expansion of the Shastras. So asking questions is very important. And he's asking questions about something that confuses him. Everybody was happy. Why is this one person not happy? What's, what's the problem? You know, sometimes we ask how it is that we're in the material world. You know, how could we be in a place where everybody's happy and yet we weren't happy? There must have been something wrong with the place. There must be something wrong with Krishna. Krishna must just say, okay, you souls, you go to the material world. I don't like you. you know. It must be his whimsy or, or his problem. But it's our foolishness. Why was Duryodhana not happy? He had every reason to be happy. And the, the palace by Mayadhanava was meant for pleasure. Why did, he, why did Mayadhanava design it so that solid floors look like water and water look like solid floors for fun. That's why he designed it in that way. It was meant to be enjoyable. And just like when Krishna's playing with the cowherd boys, they say, close your eyes and we'll give you a sweet. And he closes his eyes and do they give him a sweet? What do they give him? They give him a dandelion. I don't know if it was a dandelion, but they gave him a flower. I don't think it said which kind of flower. So did Krishna get angry? Oh, you're giving me a flower instead of a sweet. <laughs> uh, no, he was enjoying. Right? So, just because there's every reason to be happy, we still have the capacity to choose to be something else. So this was it was all in Duryodhana's mind, wasn't it? Oh, I've been so embarrassed. It says in the fourteenth chapter, Maya exists only within the mind concept that, you know, I'm so great, I'm so wonderful, etc., etc. You know, in the spiritual world, there are uh, beings who are comic, comics, they are comedians. They enjoy making people laugh, like Madhu Mangal, right? He's always doing funny things so people will laugh. And a few years ago, we were in a drama at the Govardhan retreat, and I was playing Jatila, and I realized that Madhu Mangal was also in the drama. I realized Madhu Mangal is a comic figure that people laugh with him, and Jatila is a comic figure that people laugh at her. So there's also pure devotees like that in the spiritual world that everyone's laughing at. Uh, but they're relishing that. They're not becoming embarrassed and thinking, oh, you know, Krishna's laughing at me. All the gopis are laughing at me. They're... <laughs> Let me get out of here <laughs> and start a war. You know? But they're, they're also enjoying. They're also enjoying. So Duryodhana could have taken that position. And he's the one who chose to see it otherwise. Okay, text three, which is what's on the board. She butter and I, she butter I and Irvacha. Pita Mahasyate Yagne. Rajasuye Mahatmana, Bandava Paricharyayam, Tasyayam Prema Bandanaha. Can anyone see what word is there twice? Banda. What does Banda mean? To be bound, to be, to be tied. Shri Badarayani Uvacha. Shri Badarayani Sukadeva Goswami said. Pita Mahasya of the grandfather. Te, your, Yagne, at the sacrifice. Rajasuye, the Rajasuya. Maha Atmanaha of the great soul. Bandavaha. Family members, Paricharyayam, in humble service, Tasya, for him, Asan, we're situated, Prema, by love, Bandanaha, who were bound. So, why do you think Bandavaha means family members? 
That's binding. There's, we call it family ties. Right? Don't we call it that? Family ties? What are your family ties? At the wedding, we, we tie. Right? So this is the, your family are the people to whom you have some, there's, you're, you're connected. Okay. And who's the grandfather? Pitamahasya Te. Who's the grandfather? Well, it could be. But he's, he's the great, great grandfather. Who's being spoken to here? Who's listening? Is that Parikhit? It says Parikhit is listening, and who's his grandfather? Arjuna. Arjuna, but here it's talking about Yudhisthira, who's not really the grandfather, he's really the grand uncle, but often they refer to the uncles and aunts as if they were mothers and fathers. So here Yudhisthira is being referred to here as Parikit's grandfather, although as I said, actually he's his grand uncle. Just like uh, Bhishma is often called the grandfather, immediately you said Bhishma, but is Bhishma grandfather? No, he had no children. He wasn't a grandfather at all, but he is called the grandfather, because he was the senior man in the family. Also, he acted very much as a grandfather. He acted very much as a father of a race. He raised the five Pandavas. Who else? Yes, but well, not, not Dhritarashtra's sons, because Dhritarashtra was alive. But what other fatherless children did he raise? No, not Karna. Five more. What three boys were born without any father there to raise them? Pandu's five sons. But there were another three boys. And then another two before them. Before Pandu's sons, who were the three boys that Bhishma had to raise because there was no father? Dhritarashtra, uh, Pandu, and Vidura. Who was their father? Who was their father? Yesterday. Yesterday. Was he around? Did he stick around? Mm-hmm. No, he didn't stay around at all. And technically, their father was Vichitavirya, but he had already died. And then there were another two boys that he had to raise because the father died when they were very young, before Dhritarashtra, Pandu, and Vidura. Vichitavirya and Chitangada. And Chitangada, his brother Chitangada. Because Santanu, Santanu married Satyavati when Santanu was much older. So he didn't live to see them grown up. So Bhishma raised three sets of children, although he had no children of his own. While we're talking about Bhishma. So what women did he take care of, although he never had a wife? Take care of the mothers of all those children. So who are the mothers? Kunti. And? The mothers of Dhritarashtra and Pandu and Vidura, who were they? Amba and Ambalika and their maid, and then the mother of Vichitavirya and Chitrangada, who was? Santanu's wife, his stepmother, who is? Satyavati. Prabhupada says that when Santanu saw Satyavati, he should have been thinking, this would be a nice wife for my son, instead of this would be a nice wife for me. Because his son was old enough to get married. And of course his son didn't get married. So Bhishma, although he had no wife, he had to take care of four different women, four widows. And although he had no children, he had to take care of ten children, as if they were his own children. And although he wasn't the king, he also had to run the kingdom. 
And after Shantanu died, before Vichitravirya was old enough to take the throne, Bhishma had to run the kingdom because there was no king. And then when Vichitravirya died, until Pandu was grown up, again Bhishma had to run the kingdom because there was no king. He couldn't be called the king. He couldn't get all the respect of the king, but he had to run the kingdom. And then uh, when Pandu died, Dhritarashtra was put on the throne, but Dhritarashtra couldn't really run the kingdom. So actually Bhishma was running the kingdom with just Dhritarashtra sitting on the throne which was one of, one of the reasons why Bhishma was so anxious to get a proper heir on the throne. You know, he was kind of tired of hanging around and he had to stay, he, you know, he, he, he was in charge of his own death. And he thought, well, I have to stay until the succession goes on. So he had all the responsibilities of being a father, but he wasn't a father. And he had all the responsibilities of being a husband, but he wasn't a husband. And he had all the responsibilities of being a king, but he wasn't the king. So he had all the sacrifice without any of the pleasures. He had only the tapasya. Usually in life, you do some tapasya and you get some pleasure that goes along with it. You, know, you take care of your wife and your wife also gives you some happiness, hopefully. You, know, you serve your husband, hopefully your husband gives you some happiness. But here, it was, he didn't have that. So Bhishma had a very unusual life. Anyway, he's not the grandfather mentioned here. So he was called grandfather. Bhishma was called grandfather, although technically he wasn't grandfather. Okay, so this translation in purport to text 3. Sri Bhadarayani said, At the Rajasriya sacrifice of your saintly grandfather, his family members, bound by their love for him, engaged themselves in humble services on his behalf. Purport. King Yudhisthira did not force his relatives to accept different tasks at the sacrifice. Rather, out of their love for him, they volunteered for such duties. Sri Bhadrayani Urvacha Pita Mahasyate Yagye Rajasuye Mahatmana Bandava Paricharya Yam Tayasam Prema Bandhanaha. So, Prema Bandhanaha, they are bound to Yudhisthira with love. So, Yudhisthira's family members are all what? Yudhisthira is the emperor, so his family members are all. What kind of people are they? Royalty. Royalty. But they're doing humble service. Paricharya, yeah, they're doing very humble service. Who did the most humble service? Krishna. Krishna. What did he do? Washed, Washed everybody's feet. So how many of us would agree to that? No one. <laughs> no one. So, you know, for the next big festival, so we're going to have Gorpurnima here. And okay. We're gonna, we've decided this Gorpanima, we're going to wash everybody's feet. You, know, you go to Tirupati, it's automatic. You just walk up to the temple and there's just this little stream of water flowing over your feet and then you walk on a rug and it dries your feet. So then, you know, automatic foot washing system. But if we said, okay, we're going to wash all the guests' feet, we're going to have a system set up here in the shoe room. You know, everyone's going to have their, their feet washed and their feet dry before they go in the temple. Who would like to volunteer? You know, we probably wouldn't get a whole lot of volunteers. Uh, but Krishna volunteered. And royalty, you know, I guess here in, in the UK, you have some sense about royalty. In America, we don't have any sense about royalty at all. But, you know, the royalty doesn't do menial work. You still have this consciousness in India, even among the Brahmanas, it's like that. We had in our Sandipani Muni school for the slum children, one devotee who's from America was going to train the teachers in how to teach. And she just mentioned to one of the teachers, you know, you can also have the children clean the classroom after school. And you can help them and together you can clean. And the next day they said, please don't come to the school anymore. Why? You offended that teacher by suggesting that she clean the classroom. Why? Because she's a Brahmana. And sometimes you visit Indians' homes and everything's clean except the toilet room is filthy. You know, I can't clean the toilet room. If I clean the toilet room, I'll lose my caste. Well, can't you just clean the toilet room and then take a bath and wash your clothes? No, it's permanent. You know, once you clean the toilet room, that's it. You have no caste. Uh, so there's this... And they'll have a different cleaner. You know, one, they'll have a different servant. One servant has to clump and clean the toilet room. Because even the cleaning person will become degraded if they clean the toilet room. That has to be a special outcast. You know, so they have this, this kind of idea 
I remember I was talking to my god sister Sitala, and she said, I figured out why it's so dirty in India. Because people have the idea that cleaning is only done by outcasts. And so nobody else wants to clean. So there's this concept that, you know, by my position, I can't do anything menial. I actually once heard a devotee say from the Vyasa son, I know I'm a Brahmana because I never have done any menial work in my life. All right, Krishna. Uh, all right. So, of course, this is not the vision that Srila Prabhupada gave us. Srila Prabhupada says that a Brahmana leaves a place cleaner than when they arrived. You know, so even if you go in the toilet room on an airplane or on a train and you see some, some paper on the floor, if you're a Brahmana, you pick it up. You don't think, oh, my servant Shudra will come after me, you know, <laughs> and, and do it. Well, one time we were at the beach with my family and my son said to his children, okay, everybody pick up something and bring it to the car. So his oldest daughter was probably about that time, about five years old, and she wasn't carrying anything. So I said, Tarni, you need to carry something. Everyone needs to carry something. She said, I don't want to. And I said, you know, I guess you could ask your servants. And she said, where are my servants? <laughs> All right, Krishna. Uh, so there's this, this mood sometimes among the higher class that I, you know, I don't do any menial work, but these are royalty. Our Yudhisthira's relatives, we're talking about, you know, God. How do you get any more royalty than that? You know, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, God is your relative, and Arjuna and Draupadi, and they're doing menial service. They're not thinking, you know, I'm, I'm too good for this. I'm the royalty. Hey, servants, servants, you come do this. Yeah, and there, this description is given many, many times in the Shastra, like Krishna's queens, although they had thousands of maidservants, they were personally bathing the Lord and, and personally feeding him. They didn't say, you know, well, I'm the queen, come with the servants. Now, you, you, again, you see today in, in very wealthy houses, the women don't cook. You know, there's some servant. I, we visited some, uh, the house of some wealthy people in India once, and you know, everything's done by the servants. The family members don't do anything. The servants, they came and served us on solid silver dishes, etc., etc., etc. But this, with, well, why were they doing this? Why were they doing this? Out of love. They were doing it voluntarily. It wasn't that Maharaj Yudhisthira said to them, okay, princess, you know, sweep the floor, clean the toilet, okay, God, wash the feet, come on, hurry up, hurry up, gotta be surrendered. It wasn't like that. Right? They were voluntarily serving out of love. So what is this love? No, this is the, it, a lo, love is such a thing, love is such a thing, that you do this sort of thing. That even if you're the princess, even if you're the queen, even if you're the empress, even if you're God, that you're willing to do anything to please the person that you love. This is the nature of love. You, you don't consider anymore. You know, you just, uh, Duryodhana is just the opposite. He's exactly the opposite. He's always thinking about his position and his ego and his prestige as if the most important thing in life is what other people think of him. The most important thing in life is how much other people respect him. And of course, people who are like that are so foolish. By being so offended, we all lose respect for him, isn't it? Even thousands of years later, we read about how offended he was and we just think, what a fool. Whereas just that he fell in the water, would we think, oh, what a fool. If he was also laughing, we'd think, oh, what a fun person. So people who are there very interested in their prestige and respect. But in love, that's not, you don't think about that. What do people think of me? How much respect am I getting? Is this fit for me or not? You just do. You just, oh, what can I do to, to please the one I love. So we're all very attracted and afraid of this love. I think we have a, a very strong attraction to love and we also have a, we're also a lot afraid of love. So we're attracted to love because there's nothing more pleasurable than love. There's nothing more pleasurable. We look at the rasas, the twelve rasas, which are all various ways of enjoyment. Russ is, is, a, is a taste, it's enjoyment. And we see they all have to do with relationship. They all have to do with love. Even the secondary Russes have to do with love. I'm just reading a nectar devotion about chivalry. I was just reading how at this Rajasuya that Maharaj Yudhisthira 
was, was just thinking, I want to give Krishna everything. I want to give him gold. I want to give him jewels. And he was mentally imagining that he was giving Krishna everything. And then when he looked around and saw there was actually nothing to give him, he became disturbed. So even the chivalry, wonder, comedy, it's all having to do with some relationship. The only way we have pleasure is in relationship. I mean, even what we call pleasure in this world, which is mostly the satisfaction of the body or the satisfaction of the mind, there's still some relationship. Our senses are relating with a sense object. Yes? Right. Our mind is relating with some idea or some concept. There's, there's some yoga going on. There's some relationship. And when there's love, that is the sweetest. That is the most pleasurable. The thing that we enjoy the most is love. But we're also very afraid of love because um, we say in, I don't know if you use the expression here, but we say falling in love. And everyone sannyasi say that God also falls down because he falls in love uh, with Radharani, with the gopis, with Madhya Soda, with his coward boyfriends, with the cows even. I mean, Krishna falls in love so much with the cows that when Madhya Soda says to him, at Gopastami, when Krishna is about to take care of the cows. And she says, you know, you need some shoes. Like any mother would say to their child, you know, you're going outside, you need to wear your shoes. And you need to have an umbrella for the sun. And Krishna says, well, how can I do that when the cows don't have shoes and the cows don't have umbrellas? I mean, who would say something like this? Right? The cows need shoes. They have hooves. But Mother Yisod accepts this. She says, oh, my son, there's so much dharma. But he's fallen so much in love with the cows that he won't wear shoes unless the cows have shoes. So we're afraid of this love. It makes us a little irrational. They told me in Russia there's the expression, you lose your head. You know, he's lost his head. And we see when people are in love, they are irrational. Not just love, you know, romantic love, sexual love, but which makes people particularly irrational. Probably that makes people the most irrational. What is it? Half of all murders are between romantic partners. That means that, that love makes people irrational. It turns into aversion. It makes people go crazy. Oh, I love you and you've looked at someone else. I will kill you. <laughs> They lose their rationality. But that's true, you know, love for children also. And that's true even among the animal kingdom. You know, the parents will sacrifice their lives to save their children. The mother elephant will stay if her baby elephant is dying. The herd will go on and the mother will stay with her baby in a place where there's no water, even though the baby's dying and she can't even save her baby and she'll also die. The herd will go on without her. She'll have nothing to drink and she'll for no reason and love for country I mean, even love for country we have an expression you know I would give my right arm for that but people actually do that out of love for their country which after all my dear friends is just a piece of dirt with an arbitrary line around it and here in Europe those lines change a lot have you ever seen one of those animated maps of the changing borders of Europe wow so a piece of dirt that has an arbitrary changing line around it. And for that, I have so much love. I literally give my right arm. Very, very literally. I come home without a right arm. Even love for one's company. You know, people will work 80, 90, 100 hours a week, even though they already have enough money, just to make their company successful. So love makes us irrational. Oh, people are in love with their machines. People will camp out outside a store for days to get a new machine. Three days earlier than anybody else. I mean, it's like, you know, you'll get the machine. You, know, you just wait three days. You don't have to sit in the, in the line. But they're so in love with the machine, they become irrational. So we're afraid of love. Love makes us crazy. When Krishna sees Radharani, he tries to milk a bull. And when Radharani sees Krishna, she tries to churn an empty pot of yogurt. You know, when Krishna calls the gopis, they put their clothes on upside down. You know, 
young girls going to see a young boy they're in love with, they don't put their clothes on upside down. They're very careful. But they, they put their clothes on upside down. They put on only one earring, they put their belt on their ankle. You know? <laughs> they put makeup on only one side of their face. And so we're afraid. You know, if I fall in love, I'll become crazy. We will. We'll become mad. Um, well, that is the power of love. But there's nothing more pleasurable than love. You know, material love may make us crazy in a way that we lose our intelligence and we fall down into the material pool and we forget about spirituality. But our motive is not to become neutral. You know, the Mayavadis say, the impersonalists say, the Buddhists say, you know, your attachment, your love makes you crazy. So give up all emotion. Give up all attachment. Give up all bandha. Don't be bound. Be free. What is the opposite of bandha? Is mukti. Yes? Shouldn't that be the goal of religion? Mukti? Don't be bound. Become free. But we say above the platform of freedom is another kind of bondage. Above the platform of freedom is another kind of bondage. But this bondage is a bondage that's voluntary. When we become crazy in love materially, we are actually bound. We're not really voluntarily loving. We voluntarily put ourselves under the control of the modes. But it's something like a person voluntarily drinks alcohol. And then once they voluntarily drink alcohol, their behavior isn't quite so voluntary anymore, is it? If you, if you spend any time at all around materialistic people, you'll notice they're like puppets of the modes of nature. They're just reactive. Duryodhan is like this. He's being just reactive. Oh, they're laughing. Ah! He's just a modal puppet. You know, or I always give the example of, of films, of movies. You know, so people, you can choose what film to watch, and then you're being manipulated. You're being manipulated by how fast they change the camera angle. You're being manipulated by the music. You're being manipulated by the expressions of the actors. You're being manipulated by the posture of the actors, by the storyline. And the director and the producer, they're very intentionally, okay, at this point we want the audience to laugh. At this point we want the audience to cry. At this point we want the audience to perspire. And you do. Yes? So that's not really voluntary. It's voluntary that you walk into the theater. That's voluntary. But once you walk into the theater, you're being controlled. You're being controlled. And you do things, this was Arjuna's question. Why do I do things that I don't want to do? Why does it seem that I'm being forced against my will to do things I don't want to do? And Krishna said, it was your own lust. You walked into the theater. And once you walk into the theater, once you take the drug, okay, I want to be under illusion. Okay, here's your illusion drug. You know, and there's 8,400,000 varieties of it. Then you become a puppet of that illusion. And we do things we don't really want to do that we regret later that bind us in karma and give us reactions we don't like. You know, oh, why did I drink so much? Now my head hurts. You know, but, but you drank so much. So it's just like that. You know, why, why am I drinking this cup of illusion of maya and then I get poverty and disease and so many things that come as a result but above this, when one's free of the modes of nature, one voluntarily loves. Here, there's, there's no, one's not a puppet anymore. One's not being forced by some other agency. Krishna and the devotees, here's not just love for Krishna, here's love for the devotees, love for you to steer. Krishna and the devotees, they're not forcing. There's no force. There's just no force at all. It's completely 100% voluntary. One is using one's free will at every moment, every moment, every moment, every moment, every moment. Of course, materially, we're also, Prabhupada said Krishna gives us a choice every, you know, every minute of 24 hours. We're choosing every moment to drink the illusion beverage. You know. 
I mean, of course, Prabhupada does say it's like a fan that winds down. So I think it's something like if a person drinks and they decide to become sober, they have to wait a little bit uh, while it winds down. But still, one is choosing it every minute. You know, do I want to drink the illusion beverage or not? Do I want to have that kind of intoxication? So in one sense, it's also voluntary at every moment. But in another sense, it isn't. You're saying, all right, I'm going to put myself under the control of, of my, I'm going to put myself under the control of illusion. Whereas this is very different. This is, I'm choosing to love. I'm choosing at every moment, every moment, every moment. I'm choosing to love. I'm choosing to love. And this binding, like here it's called the family, is also called, who is bind. And it gives us a little sense, you know, in a, in a, perhaps nobody has one of these anymore, but in a functional, happy family, you know, we, we really have a hard time giving analogies nowadays, but in a, in a functional, happy family, <laughs> people are, are doing things voluntarily. They're doing things voluntarily out of love. They're not doing things because they're forced. So this... Uh, Verse in purport reminded me of Srila Prabhupada's very famous letter to the managers, where he said, be very careful not to kill the spirit of enthusiastic service, which is, anybody know how that letter memorized? Spontaneous, yes. Individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. So he says, be careful not to kill the spirit of enthusiastic service, which is individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. So we don't have much time, but we'll just look briefly. Enthusiasm, individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. So enthusiasm, so Prabhupada defines enthusiasm as action uh, executed with intelligence and Krishna consciousness. And without enthusiasm, one cannot do anything. Uh, so why is one enthusiastic? Because you care about the person that you're serving. You care. So. When we offer food to Radhalandanishwar. So we should be meditating on they're actually eating this food and we should care. Does it taste nice to them? Are they enjoying it? Right? When we're dressing them, I know one, one pujari, I have one friend who's a pujari somewhere in the world. I won't embarrass her by saying where in the world it is. But she's a pujari somewhere in the world and she's had all sorts of amazing experiences with the deities. She told me one time she had a dream that she was in the pujari room and Krishna came off the altar and walked in the Pujari room and was showing her around and was saying, this is my favorite turban and I really like it when you put this jewel on the turban and I don't like this necklace very much, you know, maybe you could just give it away and, you know, going through everything in the Pujari room and this is what I like. This. And then in her dream, someone else walked into the Pujari room and Krishna ran out and jumped back on the altar and helped, picked up his flute again. But one should be thinking, you know, that when I'm dressing Krishna, does he like this? Is he enjoying it? When I'm singing for Krishna, is he, this is enthusiasm. This is the enthusiasm we feel when we love somebody. I want to make them happy. I want to make them happy. I want to make them happy. So that's enthusiasm. And enthusiasm uses Prabhupada says intelligence. So one is intelligently thinking, how can I make Krishna happy? And here again, when talk, talking just about Krishna, but about the devotees. How can I make Guru happy? How can I make the devotees happy? What can I do to make them happy? And that enthusiasm. Then individual, so we could talk for a year or so about this. Individual. So we, we serve Krishna voluntarily with who we are. We do not serve Krishna pretending to be somebody else. So this is true, of course, ultimately, in terms of our swarup that as we advance in Krishna consciousness, we're supposed to come to a point where our swarup awakens. That's what's supposed to happen. So at a certain point, one starts to awaken and one starts to feel, oh, I'm one of Krishna's coward boys or I'm one of Krishna's gopis, young gopis, or I'm one of Krishna's mothers or fathers or whatever, you know, one of Krishna's friends. That one should start to awaken to that. And that's very specific and individual. It's not that all the gopis are the same or all the coward boys are the same, or all the mothers of Krishna are the same. They're each individual. As we learn when Brahma stole the cowherd boys and the calves, that each of them had their individual likes, what they like to eat, what they like to wear, their particular personalities. Right? Some of them are very quiet, some of them are very boisterous. Right? Everyone has their own individuality. And love, you offer who you are. Right? We can't have a loving relationship, a real loving relationship, with somebody who's pretending to be something else. This is one of the things that immediately breaks relationships, is deceit. 
You know, it's, if, if somebody pretends to be something and there's something else, our relationship is broken. I was just talking on the plane with my grandson and he was saying how somebody had, had been very nice to him, been very friendly. And I said, yeah, you know, most people are friendly. He said, but sometimes people pretend to be friendly when they're not. I said, yeah, that's called a con man. You know, they're trying to cheat you, but in order to cheat you, they pretend to be your friend. So this is one of the most painful things for us as a living being. I think, it's, I think there's very few things that hurt us more than that, is when we think that somebody is a friend, we think that somebody cares about us, we think we can depend on someone, and we find out that we can't. We find out that especially if the deceit was intentional, you know, if the deceit was just due to their weakness, we may be able to forgive, although I see sometimes people can't even forgive that. But when the deceit is intentional, we really, really have a hard time with that. It can, it can devastate people for years and years and years, for lifetimes, in fact. People can, can lifetime and lifetime go on because someone intentionally deceived them that to be something that they were not. So even in our material false temporary identity, we should offer that to Krishna. Krishna says, act according to your nature. Don't do someone else's nature, even if you can do it perfectly but follow your own nature, even though it may have so many imperfections. So we offer Krishna who we are. We don't offer Krishna something else. You know, whatever is my nature, whatever is my talents, whatever is my personality. Krishna says my choice is do it for Maya or do it for me. That's it. So individual. Our service should be very individual. What do I like to do for Krishna? What do I like to do for Krishna? I mean, just a few weeks ago, I was talking to one devotee who said, you know, I just can't find what I like to do for Krishna. I said, well, what do you like to do? She said, I love theater. I just love theater. But she was living in a country where people didn't speak her native language, and she didn't speak the local language very well, and she had a hard time being in the devotees' dramas. And I said, uh, well, what else do you like to do? She said, I love to distribute books. I said, what about doing street theater? You know, set up a book table, do some street theater. And her whole, everything lit up. She said, oh, I can so individual. Spontaneous. So, of course, spontaneous we think of as, well, that's for some higher stage of Raghunuga Bhakti, and right now I'm in Vaidhi Bhakti, so I can't do anything spontaneous. I just, okay, what does it say here? Oh, okay. Number one, okay, I do number one. Number two, I do number two. <laughs> you know. But Prabhupada was saying individual, spontaneous, and voluntary as a general principle. So we may not be on the level where we spontaneously realize we're a cowherd boy. If we are, that's very nice. But if we're not yet on that level, we can still have some, oh, I'd like to do this for Krishna. You know, sometimes people think that everything they do should be orders, that real surrender means orders. But, I mean, orders is very nice if Krishna says, like, you know, okay, go to Hastinapur and see what is doing, or pick up your bow and fight. But sometimes it's also, Krishna, I'd like to do this for you. So bow should be there. Of course, then we get blessings. Spontaneous doesn't just mean I was in a temple once and the, uh, the GBC had said that he really liked yellow. So one of his disciples, when he was out of town, I'm not making this up, one of the disciples, when he was out of town, painted the outside of all of the, the, outside of all of the buildings on the property bright yellow. <laughs> you know, and he came back and he was, what did you do? Well, Guru Maharaj, you said you liked yellow. So we get blessings, you know, if you have some spontaneous desire, you know, you ask Chinese Thai Prabhu, you, you know, you don't just go do it. But there should be some spontaneous enthusiasm. It's not that Krishna doesn't just want machines, just robots, okay, do this, do this, do this, do this. So, and voluntary. So this is so important. If there's any force, my dear friends, if there's force, that is illusion. Force is the currency of illusion. And voluntary is the currency of reality. If you want to know, is this Maya or is it Krishna? Is it force or voluntary? Is a really good gauge. If you're feeling, I'm being forced, if you even try to force yourself, you're probably doing something wrong. And forcing leads to disease, actual physical disease. If you try to force others, you try to force yourself. It should be voluntary. I want to do this. Now, 
if you if you have even in your vocabulary, even modern psychology will say, get rid of words like have to and should in your vocabulary. I was talking to one devotee one time who said, you know, well, I have to give this donation. The other donor dropped out, and I have to give it. If I don't give it, the whole project will fail. And I said, Prabhu, do you want to give it? He said, I can't even think about that. I just have to. I said, were you afraid if you thought about it that you wouldn't give it anymore? I just can't even think about it. So instead, one should think, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I doing what Why am I chanting 16 hours every day? Why am I following the regular principles? Why am I waking up early in the morning? Why am I reading these books? Because I have to? Because I should? Or because I want to? Because really it is because I want to. We do have a choice. We could be doing something else. So rather, I, I choose to do this because I want something. I choose to chant my 16 rounds every day. It could even be, I choose to chant my 16, every day, 16 rounds every day because I want to keep my vow. That's still voluntary. I want to keep my promise. Therefore, I am choosing. You know, I want to love God. Therefore, I am choosing. What, what is the reason that I am choosing? By the way, that will also help us to get rid of bad habits if we figure out why we're doing them. So this love is not anything to be afraid of. We should be afraid of material bondage. Material bondage makes us dancing dogs it makes us into fools it takes the powerful wonderful soul and makes them into a fool because the objects of our love are improper and our reasons for loving are improper we're loving for ourselves not really we're not really loving so that love we should be afraid of but real love we should be eager for and not simply try to become neutral or try to become robots or try to do something that's forced, but come to the platform of real love. And this, my friends, is not something meant just for those pure devotees over there. You know, one, one devotee I was speaking to a few days ago was really struggling with something, and I said, and he said, what do I do practically? And I said, read Bhagavad Gita, chapter 12, 13 through 20. What are the qualities of a devotee? Work on having those qualities, and you'll immediately know what to do practically. He said, oh, no, this is just a list of the qualities of the pure devotee. In other words, that's not something for me. That's something for somebody else to do. So this enthusiastic individual, spontaneous and voluntary, that's for the pure devotees. And for right now, I'm going to be morose, I'm just going to be, you know, do what everybody else does. I'm going to do it because there's a rule and I'm going to force myself. And if I keep doing that, someday I'll become a pure devotee. But that's not how it works, my dear friends. If you do that, you'll be lucky if one day you ever become a pure devotee. You have to be some kind of amazing creeper that Krishna just says, oh, what a fool. All right, all right. But if we really want to become a pure devotee, then in sadhana bhakti, we practice becoming a pure devotee. And our practice becoming a pure devotee is how to be enthusiastic individuals, spontaneous and voluntary now, and how to encourage that in others. If our preaching to others doesn't encourage that, then we're not going to have a... Our society should also be like a family, where people are, are jumping up enthusiastically. Let me clean the toilet. Let me wash the feet. Out of love. So, questions, comments, additions, suggestions, subtractions. Prabhu, you had a question? Yes. Yes. I was wondering about this. Uh, you said we have to do what we want or voluntary. So, but in many, I've heard many times people are saying you have to force yourself. Even if you don't want, but you don't know, but you have to do this, you have to do this. So, we, let's say, Dangerous. So uh, my question is, do we, so we don't follow this? Let's say, who wants to follow the foreign related principle? Do you don't no, want I, to? I do, but it's hard sometimes. No, hard is another thing. There's, but because something's hard doesn't mean you don't want to. So, so my question is... People want we, to do things that are hard all the time. So we shouldn't force ourselves in any case. Because like... Force is, even, even force is wrong. To a guru, force who is wants wrong. to surrender? But you don't you want to? Surrender? I do. <laughs> I want. Just like the devotees were talking to Prabhupada 
about some devotee who had left the movement. And they said, Prabhupada, I think he left because he was fasting too much. And then Prabhupada said, no, fasting is very good. He said, but it should, be, it should not be artificial. He said, anything artificial is bad. Krishna is a person. Do you want someone to force themselves to be with you when they don't want to? Would you enjoy that? If someone says, all right, all right, this is our two hours to be together. We have a schedule, two hours to be together. <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to be here. I don't like you. I don't like being with you. I don't want anything to do with you. I am simply looking at my watch, waiting for our two-hour time to be over so I can go do something else. Would that make you happy? I'm here because I have to. My guru told me I have to sit with you for two hours right now and do nothing but think about you. That's what he told me. And I don't want to be here, but I'm doing it. Would you like that? Would you respond to such a person? Would you even stay in the room? You'd say, I'm sorry, if you don't want to be with me, I'm getting out of here. I'm not going to stay here. On some level, we must want, yes. Otherwise, what are we doing here? If we really don't want to be here, then, then don't be here. There's another 8,400,000 choices out there. You know, more than that. That's just the number of species. There's millions of choices within each species. There's an unlimited number of stories that you can go and experience in a million lifetimes. If we, it, but there must be some level at which we do want, yes. Find that. Find that. I want purity, I want happiness, I want freedom, even if that's all it is. All right, find that. I want the nice prasadam. Something, something that you want. And, and, and focus on that. Make it real. Krishna only wants it real. He's a person. Bhakti is about a person. This is not a mechanical process. It's not a mechanical process. Astanga yoga is a mechanical process. Even that needs a little bhakti if it doesn't work. Jnana yoga is a mechanical process. Karma yoga is a mechanical process. We were just in Italy and there was this one guest who was, <laughs> who was really into drugs, spiritual realization through drugs. Uh, peyote, what's the other one? Ayanushka. Ayahuasca. What's that say? Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, okay, sorry. I'm not very educated. <laughs> so this was his... Ayahuasca, okay, sorry. I'm not very educated. <laughs> so this was his... Through Ayahuasca, Ayahuasca and peyote. And we were talking about some of the devotees, and I said, you know, some of these drugs can mechanically do things sometimes to the body. They can force opening of chakras, and they can force, but it's, it's forced. It's not real. You know, the demons can even have sometimes experiences like that through force. But that it's not, you know, even jnana yoga, karma yoga, and astanga yoga are not meant to be performed mechanically. Although they, they have some mechanical basis in them. But bhakti isn't, it has nothing mechanical in it whatsoever. That's one of the offenses, is to give some interpretation on the holy name, you know. Like the one man who said to Prabhupada, oh, when you're chanting, it forces yogic breathing, and that's why it opens up your chakras, and, you know, and that's why it works. So e even to think of bhakti in some mechanical way is an offense. It's not a mechanical process. It's not that, okay, just sit like this, and say this thing, and eat this food, and do this thing, and it'll be like the little buttons on a machine. Boop, 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 ah! Vrindavan pops up. <laughs> it's about a, a loving relationship between us as a person and Krishna as a person, which is also about having a loving relationship with Guru, having a loving relationship with the devotees. And what we're meant to practice that. So there should be something there, something. Find it. Find, find where is the something. 
okay, Krishna, you know, my guru said I have to spend these two hours with you every day, and it's really hard for me because, frankly, I find you kind of boring. <laughs> and so all the time I'm sitting talking to you, my mind is thinking about my shoes, which are much more interesting than you, Krishna, and my phone, and my cat, and my whatever, the latest movie star, and the latest soccer game. But at some level, Krishna, I want to be attracted to you, and therefore I'm sitting here and spending time with you, and I'm really, really sorry that I'm more interested in what the latest soccer team did, and I'm more interested in somebody yelled at me yesterday because I slipped in the water and they humiliated me. And, you know, I, I'm very sorry that these things attract me more at this point. Than, but I come here with you because I want to be attracted to you. Please help me to be attracted to you. Some, something, something, something. At, on the level of which it really is voluntary. And then Krishna's heart will be softened. You know, there's nothing wrong with being honest with Krishna and saying, I'm really having a hard time. I'm really, really having a hard time. But on some level, I want you, and I want this, and I want perfection. I have some real voluntary attraction. You know, I read about Goloka Vrindavan, and on some level, I think I'd like to go there. You know? Yes? Why, why is Krishna interested in uh, what we like and what we want? Uh, I mean, he because he loves us. His position, I mean, is, is the position of a master and servant as a more like Audaya uh, mood? Or? Okay, but Krishna is not a master like masters in this world who don't care what you want. Um, He's not a master like a Hitler or an Italy Amin or a Stalin <laughs> who couldn't care less what you want. And they just want to use you for their own purposes. You know, even a very materialistic company, just like um, Google and, and, and Microsoft, you know, they have massage rooms in their offices and they do your laundry for you. You know that? They do the dry cleaning for their employees and they have they're they're thinking, what do my employees want? Why? Why do they think like that? They're just materialistic people. Why do they think, what do my employees want? Because they want more profit. They'll get more profit. Mm -hmm. Happy employees are going to give you more profit. It's only the most demoniac and most evil and most wicked people who want to use you without giving you anything. You know, that's the, the thief. The thief, they take your money. They don't care what, what, the, what you want to spend it on. You know, the thief, the rapist, the, they, they're the murderer. They're just stealing pleasure from you. They're not giving you anything back. Even, even just normal, selfish materialists, they usually give you back something. Yes? They try to please you in some way, even if they just want for themselves. So is Krishna going to be lower than that? Do you think Krishna's a worse boss than the people at Google? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Is he going to be more selfish? Why would we want to love him? Then he's not very lovable, is he? Such a person is not very lovable. I don't care what you want. You just do whatever I say. It's all about my pleasure. Is that a lovable person? Have you met people like that? Do you want to be with them? Would you like to be with them eternally? <laughs> I don't think so. Krishna loves us. Actually, frankly, Krishna loves us more than we love him. Because he's infinite and we're finite. So if we love him with everything we have, and he loves us with everything he has, who's loving more? If we give everything to Krishna, he gives everything to us, and he can give everything to each of us. You know that, right? It's not that he's given everything to Radharani and there's nothing left over. <laughs> He can give infinitively, and there's still infinity left over. Infinity minus infinity is infinity. So therefore, Sanatana Goswami says, each cowherd boy thinks that he's Krishna's favorite, and he is. So Krishna is giving everything to each jiva. What does it mean to love somebody? If you love someone, you want them to have what they want. It is very simple. That's what love is. 
like some of you may remember my grandson Janu who stayed here for a while so he's going to be 18 in a few days so I wrote him I said what would you like for your birthday I didn't say I'm going to give you something for your birthday and you're going to have to like it that's love so I give the example I was in I was in uh, one country, you won't say where I was. I knew I was in one country, and after my class, some girl comes and gives me a DVD. I said, I don't have any DVD player, I can't watch it. She says, oh, it's of my guru, and her guru's not in ISKCON. And I thought, okay, I can't even give it away to somebody. What am I gonna do with this? I said, I can't watch it. I didn't tell, say to her, well, I can't give it to anybody, but I just said, I, I can't watch it. I really want you to have it. I said, but I can't watch it. I really want you to have it. I said, I can't watch it. I can't do anything with it. She said, but I want you to have it. <laughs> so I, had to, I took it. I threw it away. So I told that story. And then when I went to the next country, I told that story. We we're talking about the six loving exchanges. I told that story in the class. And really, really, this is what happened. I'm, I'm not really, I swear, this is what happened. After I told that story in the class, right after the class, some man comes up to me and he says, I have a DVD for you. <laughs> He says, it's of a Mayavadi guru, so I know most devotees wouldn't want to watch it, but I think you'll really find it interesting. And I'm just there, so I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. And I said, I can't watch it. I can't. And he said, no, no. He said, I want you to have it. Okay, fine. You know, so I threw it away. So that's, that's not the way that we serve Krishna. It's not what Krishna wants. You know. It's not love. It's not that Krishna is just saying, you know, I want you to have this. He's saying, what do you want? It's, it's, a, it's a dance. Eternal reality is a dance. And a dance is it's a reciprocation between two people. That's what love is, is about. It's not only that the cowherd boys are feeding Krishna. Krishna feeds the cowherd boys too. And he feeds them what they like. You all know that story of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was serving prasada. Of course, Swarupa had to ask him to sit down because he gave everybody way too much. He was giving everybody as much as 10 people could eat. But he gave everybody what they liked. He put on everyone's plate what they liked. Lord Chaitanya didn't say, you're supposed to be spiritual here, everybody's supposed to like the same thing. <laughs> or he didn't say, no one's, you're not supposed to like anything. I mean, I was once at a, at a feast and I turned to one of the devotees and I said, this prasadam is wonderful. She said, all prasadam is wonderful. Okay. <laughs> you know, but Lord Chaitanya, he was, he's giving everybody what they like. Because he loves them. He's engaging the devotees in service according to their nature, according to their likes. That is perfection. Perfection is we realize who we are as individuals and we serve Krishna according to who we are as an individual eternally. That is perfection. That is our definition of perfection. We wake up to who we are. Oh, I'm, I'm a coward boy and I am a coward boy with Balaram and so I see Krishna is younger than me and I'm, you know, it's very specific. Do you follow it's very, very specific. It's not just, I'm a coward boy. It's, I'm a coward boy, maybe I'm a little younger than Krishna, I'm a little older than Krishna. Or I'm a gopi, am I in, in Radharani's group or Shamala's group? Or what, you know, what's my mood? Am I a left-wing gopi? Am I a right-wing gopi? Rupa Goswami gives like 360 categories, and he says this isn't even all of them. And then each has their own, we each have our own, and that's what Krishna wants. He doesn't say to everybody, okay, everybody has to wear green and everybody, like the Chinese communists, you know. Everybody has to wear, the great thing, and you have to eat the same food and talk the same way. Yes? When we serve Krishna in a, a, a spontaneously, with our individual talents, is this related to our eternal real relationship? Or is it just temporary? Um, I mean, it might be by coincidental chance, but generally not. You know, it might be. I mean, it might be that you like to paint pictures in this world, in this body, and that your eternal service is painting pictures. It might be. But that would just be circumstantial. 
just like Prabhupada really emphasizes in Nectar Devotion, the people who are now in male bodies may be gopis, and people now in female bodies can be coward boys. I mean, that's a pretty... It's one of the most key aspects of our temporary identity. As soon as you're born, you know, is it a boy or a girl? But that may not relate to our eternal identity. And in this, in this particular lifetime, we may be very, be very shy, and our eternal identity may be very outgoing or vice versa. We try on so many different roles in each lifetime. You know, we don't just change bodies. We, we, our subtle body changes, and we try being a this and that. We try, you know, sometimes we're a man, sometimes we're a woman, sometimes we're shy, sometimes we're outgoing, sometimes we're a musician, sometimes we're a construction worker, sometimes we're a teacher. As a wonderful purport in the Bhagavad Gita, where Prabhupada says, "Sometimes a saintly man and sometimes a bug." You know, so we're 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 trying on all these identities, and none of them are our eternal identity. But it's understandable that there might be something in our present temporary identity that happens to be the same as something. Some of us who are now women may also be gopis, and some of us who are now men may also be cowherd boys. But that's just circumstantial. It's not. Does that make sense? We can't judge anything at all about our eternal identity by looking at, you know, well, what do I like in this life? Well, I, I don't like spinach, so probably in my eternal identity I won't like spinach. <laughs> yes, Prabhu? Uh, uh, you can uh, stop me whenever you want, Johnny Tai Prabhu. I know I'm going over time. <laughs> well, uh, for uh, aspects you were mentioning, individuality and... Uh, Enthusias enthusiasm. Said, Be careful not to stop the spirit of enthusiastic service, which is individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. So enthusiasm... Individual, spontaneous, voluntary. Yeah. And, um, like it seems maybe individual, um, or yeah, or one leads to the others a bit. Um, yeah, they're very intertwined, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Like then enthusiasm comes and then voluntary, and yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's be, be good to have some analysis of this, wouldn't it? Yeah. That would that would be very useful, I think, for the devotees to really look at what does Srila Prabhupada say, what do the Shastras say, what does the Acharyas say about each of these four? How do they manifest? How are they defined? And how do they relate to each other? Because they're definitely related to each other. They don't exist in isolation. Thank you. Yes, uh, how can I How can I respond in a loving and spontaneous way when the service is given to me in a way that seems appears to be forced? Mm, all right, what do I do when other people try to force me? Big question. You know, because we can't, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we were in a society where everything was enthusiastic, individual, spontaneous, and voluntary? That is Goloka Vrindavan. Even Vaikuntha, everything's enthusiastic, individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. And we're trying to have an embassy of Goloka Vrindavan in this world. That's our attempt. We're trying to have it that when you walk into any Hare Krishna temple anywhere in the world, it's not, it's not just that everybody sings the Guru Vastika the same way, but you, you actually feel, oh, here's Goloka Vrindavan. But of course the reality is that this is really an embassy like in the prison. It's like a reform program that's happening in the prison. And some of the members are parolees. We have some members of our society who are on parole, you know, and some who are fully out of parole and they still come back to the prison and visit and do some programs. But the majority of our, of our members are, they're not even paroled yet. You know, and, and they're still in the prison. It's, it, they've kind of moved out of the regular cells and they're having, you know, they're given a little bit more freedom and they kind of have a special room. But there's a tendency to still act in a criminal way. And criminality is mostly about force. If you think about pretty much any crime, like if someone steals, what are they doing? They're forcing you to give your money to them when you don't want to. You, you, any, any crime, you'll see that the main element is force. Something's being forced on somebody. So we have that tendency. All of us have that tendency. And to whatever extent we're still modal puppets, we're, we're going to be, we're, to us, when you're a modal puppet, only force makes sense to you, really. It's all you really understand. And it's how you try to deal with others. We try to force our will on others. We try to force, you know, ourselves. We try to force our will on others. 
by our position, by our power connections, you know, if, if we're really powerful, maybe by fear of punishment or by a, a promise of a reward and so forth. So we all tend to do that. I'd say if someone else tries to force you, first of all, have compassion, compassion. for that person. Mm-hmm. Have compassion for that person. This person, you know, they've been a conditioned soul for billions probably of lifetimes and this is what they're habituated to. And probably the person doesn't even know what they're doing. They're probably not consciously aware that that's what they're doing to you. Next thing is to be introspective. Do I ever try to force anybody? And if you're not sure, you can ask the deities to reveal to you if you ever try to force anybody, and and pretty much I'll guarantee the answer will be yes. And uh, you can ask the Lord, please show me in what area of my life do I try to force other people? And it's, it's a heavy thing to see that and to experience that because it's very evil. It's actually kind of the root of evil, especially if we take pleasure in forcing other people. That is, that is, sort, of, that is sort of the definition of evil. I'm trying to get pleasure from someone else by forcing them to give me something that they would not voluntarily give me. And I am enjoying that process of my having power over someone else. And I'm, in, I'm enjoying that pleasure that I'm taking against their will. That is a good definition of evil. So you can ask to see that in yourself, and that makes one a little humble, which is a good thing. So when someone else is trying to force me, if I can have a little humility that maybe this is happening to me as a reaction because I do this to other people, and Krishna wants me to see what it feels like. And then a little compassion for the person. And then how to deal with it. Well, to decide, if this person wasn't dealing with me in this way, might I still choose to do this voluntarily? You know, often when somebody tries to force us, our defenses go up, and even if we would have done the thing voluntarily, we no longer want to. You know, so we we were ready to hand over the 10 quid as a donation, and someone says, you know, you have to give a 10 quid donation. Oh, I don't want to do that. You know, so let's not be like Duryodhana, and just because somebody bothers us doesn't mean we have to become defensive. So we can ask ourselves, all right, if this person wasn't trying to force me, Would I still want to serve the prasadam? Would I still want to clean the floor? Would I still want to distribute books? Maybe I wouldn't have volunteered for that specific service, but is there something here I can want? Is there something, again, that I can touch in myself that I can want? Maybe I just want to live in the ashram. Maybe it's really important to me to live in the ashram. Maybe I just want to get along with the devotees. And therefore, I'm going to voluntarily choose to do what this person is trying to force me to do, but I'm going to voluntarily choose to do it. And if if there's nothing in you that you want at all, then you need to say, I'm really sorry. I cannot do that. If you can't find anything in you at all, any want, then you say, I'm I'm really sorry. I can't do this. And whatever price is paid for that, pay that happily. And, and sometimes, I mean, I've been in that kind of a situation where there was, there was nothing there that I wanted. Nothing. You know, that somebody was trying to force me to do a particular service in a particular way, and I looked at it and said, there's, there's, there's nothing I want here. There's, this, 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 this has nothing to do with how I want to serve Krishna. It has nothing to do with the kind of of person that I want to be. It has nothing to do with my relationship with Shiva Prabhupada. And then I say, I'm really sorry. You know, I, this is not a service that I can do. You know, and sometimes people get annoyed with you, but they get over it and life goes on. Really, I mean, really. You know, we're going to die, and when we die, the whole world's going to keep turning. And, you know, and it, it, it's, not, it's not that I absolutely have to do it. it, it it's also kind of pride, you know, I have to do this, everyone's depending on me. If I don't do it, the whole temple will collapse. It's a bunch of nonsense. Seriously. Any of us, if we left, everything would just go on just fine. Hardly anybody, frankly, would even notice. They'd notice because it was a feast in your honor and there'd be an excuse to eat kalabja. <laughs> After that, everything would go on. So, you know, it's, it's okay to say no, but one should say no in that kind of circumstance. If I, because that that means it's going to damage you. That means it's something that's actually going to damage you. And then that, you know, there can be also a temporary emergency, but then there's also a want involved. 
Normally, I wouldn't want to do this, but I want to be helpful in this temporary emergency. Therefore, I will do something that I don't ordinarily want to do for a very limited amount of time. I want to be part of the team. I want to, I want to help out the group. I want, to, again, there's got to be some kind of, some, some, some voluntary. And what I, in my own experience, 95, 99% of the time, there's some voluntary in there. There's something that I want that I can agree and agree then voluntarily and happily and be enthusiastic and have some spontaneity in it and forget about the idea that somebody was trying to force me. It becomes irrelevant. But there are certain times that I've said, you know, no, this is not the proper service for me. This is not what I should be doing. It's not appropriate. And you'll just have to find someone else. And if they keep trying to force me and guilt trip me, you know, Hare Krishna. If you want, throw me out, you know. I had, I, one time when I did that, it was the winter time, and the town president said, well, I should just throw you out. And I said, I wonder if I would die first of starvation or hypothermia. And then he laughed, and the moment passed, and it was over, and everything was okay. And I didn't get thrown out. Is that all right? Thank you very much, Jane. You're very welcome. But first, humility and compassion. First, humility. I probably do this to someone. And compassion, this person probably doesn't understand what they're doing. They probably don't, don't understand how damaging it is. I think we need to stop now, because it's very, very late, even though Johnny Tai just hasn't brought out his cane yet. <laughs> He's waiting for his cane. Srila Prabhupada, Gita. <laughs> <laughs>